Uh, every night this week, we're looking at something that, each night this week, we're looking at something that you can't live without. No matter who you are, no, no matter what you believe, you have to have an identity, a solid identity. You have to have meaning in life. You have to have the kind of satisfaction that lasts through the ups and downs of, of changing circumstances. And uh, each night we're looking at one of them and asking this question, what, in what way does Christianity give arguably unequaled resources to find that thing? We all are looking for these things. And the, the, even though I'm trying to be, especially tonight, respectful of all the various views, I'm here to make a case that Christianity gives unequaled resources for each of them. Now tonight, I, uh, for those of you who have been here any other night, uh, I cannot possibly approach this subject quite in the same way. The subject tonight is, how do you get the ability to face difficulty and suffering? Uh, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb has written a book called Anti-Fragile, and in it he says, Obviously, we don't want to be fragile that when tough things happen, we fall apart. But he said, it's not enough just to say, well, how do you just get through it without falling apart? He says, we don't want to be fragile, but we don't, we don't want to just be enduring. He says, what does it mean to be a person who gets stronger through the shocks? What, 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 what kind of person do you have to be to actually grow through the suffering? And he didn't think there was a good word for that, so he called it anti-fragile. So he's written a book called Anti-Fragile, saying not just fragile, not just sort of, you know, gr gritting your teeth till you get through it, but what do you have to do, what do you have to be in order to actually be anti-fragile, actually grow through it? We all need that. But I have to tell you, in, in, when I'm talking to people who have suffered and have suffered worse than me, you've got to go at this sort of subject with a certain amount of fear and trembling and whatever humility you can muster. But I would like to show you what Christianity has to offer, and Simon's already made reference to it, but I'd like to take a look at what we've been doing each night. I would like to look at a text in the book of Mark. It raises the issue, we'll reflect on the issue, and then at the end I'll bring you back to the text to show you actually what the Christianity offers in order to give us the thing we're looking for, which is being anti-fragile, being someone who not just bear up under, but actually grow into something wiser and deeper and happier even through troubles and suffering. Um, I'm going to read from uh, Mark chapter 5. What I've been saying every night is if you want to follow along, there are Gospels of Mark out there, but you may just want to listen to me. And I'm going to be reading from Mark 5 verses 22 to, tw to 42, and I'm actually going to give you only excerpts. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and pleaded earnestly with him, Jesus. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Now a large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. She had spent all she had and rather than getting better, only grew worse. When he heard about Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched him, his cloak. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with the people crying and wailing loudly, he went in and said to them, Why are all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old, 
At this, they were completely astonished. Now, there's actually three kinds of suffering already you see in here. Uh, The little girl is acutely ill. She's on the verge of death. The, uh, The woman is chronically ill, and she's not just chronically ill with the bleeding, but on top of that, she has been uh, the victim of uh, malpractice. She's been, uh, she spent all of her money on doctors. The doctors have only made her worse. Uh, I think they have a name for it now. It's called iatrogenic, uh, which is treatment-induced trouble, which means she not only has the pain in her body, but she has anger toward people who have abused her. And then, and then the little girl's father. Uh, When you love somebody deeply who is suffering, that itself is a unique kind of suffering, which is often overlooked by the people around. Everybody's looking at the little girl, she's suffering. But the parents, if you love someone deeply who is suffering, that is a form of suffering. Uh, And it's uh, the powerlessness is smothering. Suffering comes in forms innumerable, and therefore suffering is inevitable. Suffering is inevitable. To some degree, it's coming. And suffering will make you worse or better. It will make you harder or more tender. Uh, It'll make you weaker or stronger. But it will not leave you as you were. It will radically transform you one way or another. And which way depends on your response. And it's on its way. The suffering is on its way if it hasn't already found you. So you see how incredibly crucial it is to ask the question, how do you handle it? In fact, how could you even perhaps grow through it? So let's do the reflection. First of all, let's look, reflect on the various ways that various cultures help its members find, uh, handle suffering. And then secondly, again, we'll look at what does Christianity have to offer. Now, when I, when I say let's look at what the different cultures are doing, for a moment, let me put secular culture here and all other cultures here. I'm going to get back, as you know and you expect, to talking about how Christianity has unique uh, resources. But for a moment, let's keep something in mind. Before the secular modern culture came along, all other cultures and all other religions, to some degree, said your meaning in life, your life purpose, the thing you're living for, is nothing inside this material world. So the meaning of life for uh, the monotheistic religions and cultures was the meaning of life is to live and believe in such a way that you go to heaven and live with God and your loved ones forever. Uh, The meaning of life in karmic cultures is to live a life of uh, such virtue that you eventually escape the cycles of reincarnation and you go into eternal bliss. Uh, The meaning of life in uh, Buddhism is that you need to be overcoming the illusion of the material world and of an individual self, so you eventually go into the all soul. Uh, In shame and honor cultures, the meaning of life is to live honorably, even bravely, uh, so that you not only bring an honorable name to your family, but then you die and you rest with your ancestors. It's all about family. It's all about the name of your family. It's all about honor. Now, you see, in every case, what this means is, because your meaning in life, in whatever culture, was actually not something inside this material world. Suffering not only can't take your meaning in life away, but it actually in some ways can enhance it. Because suffering uh, in a shame and honor culture, to die in glory, (laughs) it was actually a way to reach your goal. And in all other cultures and other religions, suffering was actually seen as a way to grow in virtue or in honor or, or even as an impetus for salvation. In other words, every culture until modern culture, since the meaning of life was something outside of this material world, suffering, which takes away things in the material world, can't get at your meaning in life. In fact, if anything, it can enhance it. But the secular uh, viewpoint is completely different. Uh, uh, what is the secular viewpoint? Well. The secular worldview says uh, either there's no God or we can't know if there's a God. That uh, everything, everything has a natural cause. That there's no transcendent or supernatural dimension to reality and there's certainly no afterlife. So in the secular worldview, what's your meaning in life? Whatever your meaning in life is, it's always got to be something inside this material world. It's got to be success financially or politically, it's got to be romance, it's got to be love, it's got to be something inside. 
And of course, you know what that means. It means in the secular worldview, suffering, well, that's what suffering does. What suffering does is it takes away those things. That's what makes suffering suffering. It, took, it takes away love. It takes away success. It takes away health. It takes away those things. And if your meaning in life is in those things, it doesn't just take away material things. It destroys your very meaning in life. Read Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, or, Le or less well-known, Langdon Gilkey, Shantung Compound. Uh, Langdon Gilkey was put in an internment camp in uh, China during World War II by the Japanese. Uh, Viktor Frankl was actually in Auschwitz but survived, and he was a Jewish psychiatrist. And both of them talk about what happens to people who actually have their meaning in life be something in this world, and when it's all taken away from them, what happens to them? They either go evil or they shrivel up into a little ball and disintegrate. Richard Schweder, who's a prominent cultural anthropologist at the University of Chicago, says that of all the cultures in history, secular culture gives its members by far the least resources for handling suffering. Uh, one person who's testified to this was Paul Brand. Uh, Paul Brand was a pioneering orthopedic surgeon. He was British, uh, and he was pioneering in the uh, treatment of leprosy patients, but he spent the first part of his medical career in India, and the last half of his medical career in the United States. And this is what he says, uh, Americans listen up. He says, in the United States I encountered a society that seeks to avoid pain at all costs. Patients uh, in the West lived in far greater comfort, a far greater comfort level and a level of safety than anyone I had previously treated, but they seemed far less equipped to handle the suffering and far more traumatized by it. And Richard Schweder adds this. He says, when it comes to the secular culture, he says, the reigning metaphor of the contemporary secular view is suffering is just chance misfortune. The sufferer is a victim under attack from impersonal forces devoid, uh, devoid of intentionality. And that means suffering is separated from the narrative structure of human life, a kind of noise, an accidental... Uh, an accidental interference into the life drama of the sufferer. Suffer, suffering, therefore, has no intellig intelligible relation to any plot except as a chaotic interruption. Whereas in all older cultures, suffering was seen as an expected part of a coherent life story, a crucial way to become the person that you want to be and to grow as a person and a soul. Uh, Larissa McFarher was a staff writer for The New Yorker, uh, she is, I mean, and she, uh, at one point she did a lot of research on a particular kind of person. She was doing research on people who lived in extremely dangerous places in the world, usually to provide medical care, but in places where there was high possibility of contagion and death and places where there was a high possibility and, uh, of uh, persecution or capture or violent death. And she was studying people who actually endured suffering uh, in order to help other people. And she did her research. Another man, by the way, who did this, who was a, also a journalist, was Nick Kristof of the uh, New York Times. And what both of them found was that almost all of the people that they, they found and they admired very much were devoutly religious people devoutly religious. And there were virtually no secular people doing such a thing. And at one point, uh, Larissa was uh, interviewed in the Boston Review. And in the Boston Review, uh, she was asked, she said, are you religious? And not only was she not religious, but she wasn't raised in any kind of religion. She had no religious background. She said, I'm a completely, totally secular person. So the interviewer <laughs> asked, does it make you wonder, uh, as a secular person, what gives religious people the ability to face suffering like this? And she was extraordinarily candid, and here's what she said, two things. She said, first of all, with many religious traditions, there is an acceptance of suffering not just as part of life, but, ne but not necessarily a bad thing at all, because it takes you and makes you become the person you want, or even pushes you towards salvation. And then she says, for people of faith, God is in control and God's love will see the world through. 
Whereas for secular people, it's all up to us. We're here alone, and that's why I think, for a secular person like myself, there is an additional layer of urgency and despair whenever I face suffering. So if it's true that uh, secular people and secular worldview gives very little in the way of resources for suffering, uh, okay, do we say, well, let's get religious? Well, of course, I'm here to tell you that uh, Christianity has something unique. And so let me now give you three last ideas. The one is that Christianity differs from many of the other religions and secularism in three ways. Let me tell you what they are. And now we're going to get back to the text. The first is this. Unlike shame and honor religions, I don't know if you've been part of a sort of a shame and honor culture, a non-Western culture you might be, uh, very often suffering is something that you're supposed to handle stoically, stiff upper lip. Don't blubber about it. Don't melt down. Don't grieve. Get over it. Of course, as you know, the uh, ancient Greeks uh, uh, were uh, particularly, some of them were actually worse Stoics. That's where we get our name. And so in many cultures, the idea is you don't grieve. You, you know, if you really want to be a person of virtue and self-control, don't do that. But unlike the shame and honor cultures and religions, Christianity pioneered an enabling of grief that didn't destroy you. It pioneered an enabling of grief that didn't destroy you. First of all, just take a look at the text for a second. Uh, it's remarkable that uh, for Jesus Christ, who was a respectable male Jewish man, a woman with a flow of blood from her uterus, that's what's happening here, who therefore was ceremonially unclean, according to many of the religious uh, ceremonial laws, comes and touches Jesus, and he has no problem with it. Not only that, he brings her around and gets her to speak and to tell what's happened, and then uh, speaks so uh, warmly to her, saying, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Your suffering speaks to her suffering. You can find this on the internet. Here's a man you never heard of. A hundred years ago, he taught at Princeton Theological Seminary, Princeton, New Jersey, uh, a man named B.B. Warfield, and he was a biblical scholar, and he wrote an article called The Emotional Life of Our Lord. The Emotional Life of Our Lord. And all it is is an in-depth, detailed look at every place in the New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where it ever talks about the emotional life of Jesus. And this shouldn't surprise you, but when he analyzed it, far more than any other emotion, Jesus Christ is a man of sorrows. He's a savior, but he is not stoic. He's always weeping. He's always grieving. He's always moved with compassion, which is really a form of grief. Now, there's a great book that actually I'm, I'm channeling right now in this talk. Uh, Ronald, uh, pardon me, it's a, the, the name of the book, to make absolutely sure, Ronald Ritker's The Reformation of Suffering. It's an Oxford University press book. I'm just saying that to make sure I get credibility for my citation. And it's a history of the different cultural ways of approaching suffering. And what he points out is that one of the reasons, well, one of the questions that historians always ask is why did Christianity essentially displace the old Greco-Roman pagan world? Why, why did Christianity grow so much? Why was it so popular? Why was it so attractive to society that essentially displaced the older culture? And he says, among other things, it was the Christian's resources for suffering. Because what he says, and there's other historians that he cites, was that, you know, Cicero and Seneca, the great you know, classic, the, the great poet, uh, uh, philosophers of antiquity, they believed, like the Buddhists, that even though you continued after death, you didn't continue personally. You just went into the soul. You didn't keep your personality, and they believed that love, therefore, was uh, epiphenomenal. It was, uh, it was temporary. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, they were the ones who said, don't get too attached to anybody, and if you're really going to be a person of virtue, don't let it get to you. Don't let things bother you. And what Ritger says, and the other historian said, is that was a very difficult thing for the populace to hear, to be told, don't grieve, you know, that's a sign of weakness. Along comes Christianity, totally different in two radically different ways. On the one hand, along comes a weeping Savior, Jesus Christ, the exemplar, you know, the one we're all aspiring to, and he's always crying. He's always weeping. There's no stiff upper lip about him. And yet, 
Ritker says. Christianity gave people three things to kind of rub into their grief, the way you put salt into meat. When you put salt into meat, it keeps it from going bad. And there were three things that Christians rubbed into their grief so they could weep and weep and weep, but it didn't go bad. It didn't turn into despair or hardness. What were those three things? He says, the culture didn't have them, only Christianity had them. Number one, a God who suffers. There is no religion, no other religion, that says God, second person of the Trinity, the God the Son, Jesus Christ, the immortal, he comes into this world and he becomes mortal and he gets flesh and he suffers with us. There is no other, there's no other religion that says that, Ritger says. And the idea, and we've already talked about it, the idea to simply have somebody, to have a God who says, I know what it's like. To have a God who says, I know what it's like. Who subjected himself to that. that, that no religion ever said that, number one. Number two, Christianity said, you stay personal after death. And you go to live, not only in a love relationship with God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who've been loving each other for all eternity, and then you, you step into that joy and that glory and that love with God and loved ones. But uh, Jonathan Edwards, a, an 18th century American uh, uh, pastor and philosopher, has a sermon, a classic sermon. It's also out on the internet called Heaven is a World of Love. Stop thinking about harps and streets paved with gold. Heaven is a world of love. So the second thing that Christians were given was a God who suffers, heaven is a world of love, and then the resurrection. In the end, we actually get our bodies back. And therefore, the future is not simply a kind of an ethereal, uh, otherworldly place, but a new heavens and a new earth. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. He ate a fish in the presence of his, of his disciples to say, hey, a, he says, I'm not a ghost. A spirit hath not flesh and bones, he said to them. And when you think about that idea, that means it's not just that the hope of Christians, we'll look a little bit more at this tomorrow night, it's not just a consolation for the life that you lost, it's the restoration, of not only of the life you lost, but the life you never really had. And so if you take that kind of hope and you just rub it into your, your tears, you can, t you can cry, you will cry, you should cry. It's really quite unhealthy not to cry. But how do you make sure your tears don't turn you into somebody hard, despondent? And that's the reason, one of the reasons why Christianity flourished and grew. So number one, Christianity, unlike the honor and shame religions, actually enabled and pioneered grieving. Number two, more briefly, Christianity, under like the, unlike the karmic religions, believes that suffering is quite often uh, disproportionate and unjust. Disproportionate and unjust. I have to say, with all due respect to anyone here who's Hindu, uh, I have, as a pastor, when people come to me and say, why did this happen? Why did that happen? How could, how could that happen? I've occasionally wished I was a Hindu for a while. Because, as you know, uh, in the karmic religions, the idea of reincarnation is that if you're suffering in this particular incarnation, it's because you're suffering for some sin you did in the past. Which means, it's kind of neat, actually, uh, it means that there is no such thing as unjustified suffering. Uh, it may look unjustified within the space of your particular life, but not in the space of your, you know, the life of your soul. And therefore, hey, there is no, there is no unjustified suffering. Now, with all due respect to a great world religion, I'm afraid that's too neat. And I'm not sure it actually, how do I say it, does justice to injustice. <laughs> I don't think it does justice to injustice. And what we have in the Bible is this, and actually Simon alluded to it. If you look at the whole biblical story of the entire Bible, it starts off by showing us that God actually did not create a world filled with suffering. He didn't put cancer in the world. He didn't even put death in the world. And the biblical storyline is that when we turned away from God, everything started to fall apart. Everything in our soul, our body, in the world, everything fell apart. And therefore, he didn't invent this. But, and what that means is, 
part of the brokenness of the world that we now have is unjust and disproportionate suffering. One of the most remarkable books of the Bible, of course, is the book of Job. In the book of Job, Job suffers disproportionately and unjustly. Terrible things happen to him. He didn't deserve them at all. But, of course, his friends come along, you know, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, uh, and they come around and they say, well, you know what? There is no unjust suffering. If, you are, if, you are, if your life is going bad, you must have done something wrong. You must have. They don't believe in unjust suffering. They didn't believe in it. At the end of the book, God is furious at them because uh, he's, he's furious at them for believing that there is such a thing, uh, that there is no such thing as unjust suffering. That's what the book's about. Innocent people suffer disproportionately. It's part of the brokenness of this world. But here's the interesting thing, as we see. In Jesus Christ, you have the ultimate example of why I think karmic religion is wrong. Because if there's one person in the history of the world that deserved a good life, it was Jesus. He lived, he loved the Lord, he loved the Lord, his Father God, with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind. He loved his neighbor as himself. He did not deserve what he got, but he did. He got all that. And that proves that God himself understands what it's life like to suffer unjustly. So Christianity does not ever say, oh, if, you, if you've done something, if, you know, if you're suffering, you must have done something wrong. There are still, by the way, Christians who walk around with that assumption, radically unbiblical, radically wrong. So Christianity, unlike honor and uh, uh, shame and honor cultures, does not say stoicism. It actually encourages healthy grieving. Secondly, unlike the karmic religions, it absolutely says so much of, of suffering is horrible. It's horrendous. It's unjust. It's something we ought to scream about. But number three, unlike secular, the secular worldview, Christianity says suffering is never pointless. Suffering is never pointless, which is as what you saw uh, the various secular authors said to a secular person, basically suffering is pointless. Suffering is never pointless. Let's take a look at the text and then we're done. Jesus goes, uh, is on his way to heal this little girl who's sick and dying, and he stops to talk, uh, to deal with this woman. Now, a chronically a woman who's been, uh, been uh, sick for 12 years could wait another hour but the little girl can't wait an hour, and yet she, he stops to deal with a woman. And isn't this a perfect picture of what irritates us about God? What is God thinking? This makes no sense. The timing's all wrong. This is re- the little girl's dying. This woman could wait. The little girl can't wait. Jesus stops. Let's, let's c- come and talk. Bring it out. No surprise, the little girl dies. What is, what is her father thinking? She, he's looking at Jesus saying, what is the matter with you? But Jesus will not be hurried. He will not be hurried, even though it makes no sense to our human reason why he's not, not hurrying up. But here's the thing. Jesus can see things that our human reason can't see. Now, because we have the text, we're able to get a picture of something that, by the way, in 99.99999999% of all the suffering that we're ever going to see or experience, we don't get a picture like this. We don't get it. Simon even said something about that. He says, I don't believe. I'm not waiting to see why. I don't believe I'll ever know why. But here we have a little text. Jesus, st- Jesus knows what you and I don't, that something has to happen in this woman's soul and character that requires him to stop, that she does need him to stop, he also knows that the little girl is not going to be any the worse off for his delay. See, we don't know that, but he does. In fact, there's going to be more joy and glory when he gives her what he wants to give her. So he gets there, and he sits down alongside of her. He tells everybody she's asleep. They laugh at him. And he sits down, and he takes her by the hand, and he says in Aramaic, which, by the way, is a, a mark that this is an eyewitness account, not a legend. In Aramaic, it's an eyewitness memory. He says, Talitha kum. Now, it gives you the little, uh, it gives you a little bit of a, uh, it gives you a literal translation. Literally, Talitha is a diminutive of the word girl. So it means little girl, get up. But what you don't know is that it's actually a diminutive word, but it was also an intimate word. It was a word of affection. It was a word that parents use with their children a better translation would be sweetheart. 
Jesus sits down next to the dead girl, takes her by the hand, and says, sweetheart, it's time to get up. The way a mother would say it on a you know, sunny morning, sweetheart, it's time to get up. And then he lifts her up right through death. You say, oh, wait a minute, didn't he say she was just asleep? Yeah. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean she wasn't dead. Because, by the way, in the Gospel of Luke, it says her spirit returned to her. In the, in the Gospel of Luke that gives you the same story, it explains very clearly she was dead. Well, then why would he say she's asleep? Here's what he's saying. Look at my power and look at my love. Death is the most implacable, inexorable foe that a human being has. And Jesus just reaches right through it, takes her by the hand, and pulls her right up. It's his way of saying, if I have you by the hand, even death is just a nice night's sleep. And Jesus is also saying, and Mark is trying to show us this too, is, oh no, probably most, it very, very seldom is anybody who is actually physically dying going to be raised from the dead. That's, that's rather unusual. But if Jesus Christ has you by his hand, even death is just a nice night's sleep. Death will not be the last word in your life. And look, what, look at his tenderness and then ask this question. Why would you want to hurry somebody like this? Sweetheart, it's time to get up. Why would you want to hurry somebody like this? So here's the assurance. If you've been reading the entire Bible narrative, you'll know there's a problem. Of course, you haven't been with me, so the problem is we've already learned that the wages of sin is death. The Bible sets that up. It's the reason for the suffering of the world anyway, because we've turned away from God. So how can Je if, if death is the punishment for our sins, according to the Bible, how can Jesus Christ raise her up? Of course, the answer is he goes to the cross, which means he gets death so she can get life. He sinks so she can rise up. See, He goes into darkness so she can get up and see the light. And so here's my assurance that death is not pointless. Do we know what the reason is that God has not stopped suffering? He didn't create the world of suffering, and he says he's going to end it. So the real question is, why is he allowing it to keep on going? Why is he allowing it? Why does he let the terrible things happen? Okay, I don't know what the answer to that question is, but I do know now what the answer to that question isn't. It can't be that he doesn't love us. It can't be that he doesn't love us. Look at his love. Look at his tenderness. Look what he's willing to do. Die for us. You see, when you have a God who is willing to come and plunge himself into our suffering and experience that for us, I still don't know what the reason is that he's allowing suffering, but I know what it isn't. It can't be that he doesn't love us. He does. And that's the reason why, though I don't know, and Simon doesn't have any idea, probably in his entire lifetime, why? When you rest in the fact that there is a point to it and that he does love us, you rub that into your grief and it takes, makes you into something really good. Uh, Ernest uh, Becker, who wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Denial of Death, there's an interesting place where he says, I think that taking life seriously means something like this, that whatever man does on this planet has to be done in the lived truth of the terror of creation of the rumble of panic underneath everything, otherwise it is false. I believe the Christian gospel, the Christian God absolutely takes the rumble of panic seriously because he plunged himself into it himself. He experienced the terror himself so that he could release us from it forever. Okay, uh, done and on this very <laughs> difficult subject and I think we're gonna take some questions. So, oh interviewers, please come. Um, so this first question says, in light of everything you spoke about regarding suffering and also trusting in God, how do you explain unanswered prayers? Unanswered prayer. Unanswered prayers. Well, actually, unanswered prayer, is a, that's a great question because uh, I, I said suffering comes in innumerable forms. Uh, and I think answered prayer is, a, is quite very much a form of suffering. Um, you pin your hopes on something. Usually you don't pray. I have to say, most of us don't pray enough. 
And therefore, when we do pray, it's usually because there's something we're really passionate about. Uh, we don't usually take our, our daily life to God in prayer. We usually wait until there's something we're really upset about or something we really want and we pray about it. And therefore, unanswered prayer is terrible. Here's what I can tell you. again: I, I'll play the same trick on you I just played. I think it's unfair to say trick. But I'll make the same move. Uh, Jesus Christ experienced a rather remarkable unanswered prayer. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. And what he meant, the word, the cup was a representation of what he was about, the cup he was about to drink. It was a, uh, it was a metaphor uh, in those times for suffering, actually, suffering. Uh, to drink a cup meant, a bitter cup meant the, the suffering. And he knew he was going to the cross, and he actually says, Father, if there's some other way that we can do this, let this cup pass from me, which is a remarkable thing. Uh, there's, been, there's been a great deal of reflection on this, uh, nobody thinks that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was surprised. Um, uh, it, it, uh, the cross was not something that, I mean, he knew he was, he was talking about it for years. He knew where he was going. But uh, evidently, in his human nature, uh, he began to sense just how agonizing it was going to be, and he shrank from it in a normal human way. Uh, and he just said, uh, is there some other way? Let this cup pass from me. But then he immediately added, not my will but thine be done, which is actually, I think, the way you are supposed to pray, which is, on the one hand, you're not a fatalist. You know that God cares about you, and actually there is a lot of answered prayer, lots of answered prayer. At a certain point, you have to say, but you're God and I'm not. Uh, you can see the whole and I cannot. Uh, let me give you one example of this. When Job uh, was suffering unjustly, what if God said to him, Job, would this help? Do you know that you're going to become the most famous sufferer in the history of the world, that hundreds of millions of people are going to be helped and inspired by your, uh, by your example? In fact, do you know that on uh, February the 7th, 2018, that there's going to be a huge hall in the middle of one of the great university towns uh, in, uh, in the world talking about you? In other words, hundreds of millions of people are going to be helped for the, till the end of time. Would that make it any easier to, to handle your suffering, and Job would have said, wow, okay, you know, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Bring it on, you know, I mean, this is going to be great. But he didn't know at all. And therefore, in the end, he had to say, thy will be done. It, it, he struggled for 42 chapters uh, in iambic pentameter, and he's still, uh, uh, and that's why he's so real, and that's why we learned so much from him. But in the end, he wasn't told and he did submit. He didn't know why. In the end, he basically said, Would this, let this cup pass from me, not my will, but thine be done. So you're supposed to let your needs be known. There's nothing wrong with struggling like he did. Uh, in the end, uh, we, even Job has no idea. But I do think the book of Job is there to tell us there is a plan. And, and yet, in some ways, you wouldn't become the kind of person God wants you to be through it if you knew the plan. Because ultimately, he wants you to learn the same kind of uh, love and wisdom and patience that uh, Job and Jesus learned. So uh, unanswered prayer is a toughie, a really tough one. But don't forget, the one you're praying to actually understands what it's like. So when you pray to Jesus, he knows how you feel. Thank you. Um, our next question is, um, oh, and I, I won't ask any of my own questions tonight, Tim. Um, <laughs> after last night, mm. it wasn't great. Um, yeah. Is this, how do you deal with personal suffering that is caused by Christians or the church itself? Well, that's easier. You can really be mad at them. <laughs> um, it's an, that's, this, that's another talk, another night. Uh, I would say, when some people tell me, what's the Achilles heel of Christianity? That is to say, what is the thing that probably makes Christianity the least credible to a thoughtful person? Uh, I don't think it's evil and suffering. I mean, I do know many people say, I can't believe in, in God because of evil and suffering. I would suggest looking at uh, John Gray's uh, latest book, Seven Types of Atheism. Uh, John Gray's an atheist, but in the book he says that if there is no God, there really isn't a problem of evil and suffering. The world's just the way it is. Uh, and what he's really saying is, 
evil and suffering is a problem for Christians, and actually Simon said in some ways it's a bigger problem when you say, I believe in a good God. But it's a huge problem for everybody. It's a problem for non-Christians, a problem for atheists. I don't think evil and suffering, nobody's got the full answer, so it's not the main objection. The, main ob the strongest objection to Christianity, and the one that's probably shaken me the most, like it probably has many of you, is the behavior of certain Christians. Um, if you're a Christian asking this question, then you have to forgive the people who've wronged you. If you don't forgive them, they will uh, win because you will stay angry at them and they'll shape your behavior. If you are bitter, if you can't forgive somebody, then the person who's wronged you actually controls your life in some various ways forever until you forgive them. So the only way to, in a sense, make sure that you overcome evil with good, not only in their life but in your life, is you forgive. It's the only way you'll ever be able to treat them without vengefulness, and it's the only way that you yourself will be able to not be shaped and distorted by them. So you need to forgive, and the reason you need to forgive is because Jesus forgave you, that you've got incredible resources. So if, if Christians have wronged you, you need to forgive them. If you're not a Christian believer, I would just say that uh, please don't let what Christians do completely put you off the faith. Uh, here's my own little uh, judo move on you. Uh, what you don't like about Christians is they're not living up to their own standards, right? In other words, what, what's so uh, infuriating about Christians who wrong you and do injustice and, and mistreat you is they're not living up to Jesus' standards. They're not living up to Christian standards. What that means is they are failures or the church is a failure, but that doesn't really undermine the validity of Christianity, does it? Because what you're actually doing is you're using the standards of Christianity uh, to critique them, which is perfectly right, but it doesn't undermine Christianity itself. So if Christians have wronged you, that doesn't necessarily mean Christianity is wrong. In fact, in some ways, um, you're affirming uh, the, some credibility to Christianity just by the way you critique them. But by the way, you need to forgive too. I don't know what resources you're going to use, um, but you must forgive people who have wronged you or else they distort your life and they win. So that's what I think. You have, you have to forgive them, uh, and that's the best thing, the best way. <laughs> My wife... Uh, notice what she did there. Now, you probably didn't hear it. She said, what you usually say. So this is a way for her to say, I'm not undermining you in any way. I'm actually just reminding you of the wisdom you usually have. <laughs> and and, and what, what she's reminding me of is this, that uh, you not only need to forgive people who've wronged you, but you will only pursue justice well if you've forgiven them. Uh, I think right now in our, in our culture today, by the way, honey, thank you, uh, the, the, you're absolutely right. The only way in our culture right now to pursue justice seems to mean you don't forgive. Because if you forgive, then if you, you, you're not pursuing justice, right? That's, it's like one or the other. I can't forgive him or her or them because then they go free. Not at all. As a matter of fact, look, let me just be real personal. If someone wrongs me, I have to forgive them. Jesus, by the way, in Mark chapter 11, verse 25 says, if you're standing and you're thinking of something you have against somebody, forgive them. You don't wait for them to repent. You forgive them. Why? Because unless you learn to forgive, and that's another subject which I'm not getting into, when you do go to pursue justice, it won't be justice, it'll be vengeance. Do you know the difference? You see, uh, justice means I'm really, for the sake of the perpetrator and the sake of the other people the perpetrator might be hurting, and for the sake of justice itself, I want to stop that person. I want to bring them to justice. But there's another reason to go after them, and that is I just want to make that sucker suffer because I suffered. And if you do, you'll always overreach, and you'll never reclaim them because they'll see the, the, you'll, they'll see the anger in your eyes. And therefore, even if you try to show them that they're wrong, they'll never believe you because basically you're not really arguing with them, you're paying them back. Unless you forgive from the heart before you pursue justice, you won't be pursuing justice. You'll just be creating a kind of back and forth blood feud, back and forth and back and forth. So my wife's absolutely right, as she usually is. <laughs> Thanks, Tim and Kathy. Um, 
I'm going to repeat this question because I think some people are finding it hard to hear. Um, so this one says, how can you explain natural disasters? Human suffering is one thing, but this is God's beautiful creation that seems to be going so very wrong. So the question is, how can you explain natural disasters when it seems to be God's creation that's going wrong? Uh, actually, I can be short on that, even though it's probably... Uh, if, you, if you look at Genesis, however you take the Genesis story, it's teaching us something, that as soon as Adam and Eve turned away from God, four things happened. First of all, they were alienated from God. They, they couldn't stand in God's presence. You call that spiritual alienation. The second thing is they were ashamed and they hid from, they, they hid. That's psychological alienation. They, they experienced guilt and fear and so on. Then thirdly, they, they, uh, they were naked and then they had to cover themselves because they had to hide from each other. Well, let's call that social alienation. So when they turned from God, their relationship with God broke down, their relationship with themselves broke down, their relationship with others broke down, so there's social alienation. But then lastly, it said that instead of the garden just producing fruit, now you're going to have to labor and it, uh, in, in the sweat of your brow and thorns will come up uh, instead of fruit and eventually you're going to die. And that's actually, how do I say it? That's environmental alienation. That's uh, natural alienation. The Bible teaches that natural disasters, that, uh, uh, that the, 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 the nature is no longer our friend, that we're alienated from it. And very often terrible things happen because it's actually not, uh, the, it's not in its original order. That is to say, the created order was perfectly harmonious uh, psychologically, social, sociologically, physically, and all the relationships have been disrupted when we turned away from God. Th that's a little harder for us to grasp. I think most of us realize, okay, if I'm, a, if I'm a sinner and I'm selfish, I can see why that would lead to murder and theft and so on. It's a little harder for us to see that turning away from God would have actually affected the natural environment, but it's what the Bible says. And I think when you think about how much we are woven into the natural environment, how Human beings are absolutely part of the warp and woof of the natural environment. It does make sense. But anyway, that's, the, that's the, the answer of Christian theology that over the years has made a great deal of sense to me, though I'm not sure. Uh, I, I had to be pretty brief there. But at least please feed on that. Think about that. Brilliant. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this evening. So let's give Tim a round of applause. Thank you very much.